All right. Well, um, I think that was a pretty cracking start to uh, our live stream today. Um, I, said, I, I was really blown away. I th thought it was really, really fascinating um, how that all came together. But again, we're, we're not here just to listen to, to Aaron speaking for, for a while. Um, so I'm going to bring on our next presenter. Um, our next presenter is Luke Barker, um, and he is going to be talking about uh, different kinds of architectures that we've got, um, clean architecture versus uh, vertical slice architecture. So I, having seen some kind of interesting patterns that was played out with, with Uno, I'm really keen to see um, more on like just an architectural approach to .NET projects. So Luke, let's bring your screen up and over to you. For sure. Thanks, Aaron. Welcome everyone to this talk. So today we're talking about vertical slice architecture and how it compares to clean architecture. So let's jump right in. To start, we'll jump through CA and basically how we got there. So how it started and where we are at the point now where a lot of enterprise backends are written in clean architecture. Then we'll talk about vertical slice architecture a little bit. And similarly, why we might get to the point of vertical slice architecture. And then lastly, I'll show a cool demo, how you can get up and running with VSA using a nice .NET new template that I prepared earlier. A little, bit about, a little bit about me first. I'm Luke Parker, a software engineer, currently working for SSW. I'm a software architecture guru, so I'm always watching all the blogs and keeping up to date. Uh, and I love open source, newly addicted to going to the gym. Uh, and you can look at my GitHub or blog uh, at the links below. So let's jump into clean architecture. Now to start, let's talk about what happens when you have no architecture. So Using a web API as the example here, you might have a client that hits your web API, and then inside of the web API, you might have a mess of three things going on usually. You'll first of all have presentation logic. Now that could be HTTP verbs, mappings, routes, JSON, serializing, all of that stuff to get it over the wire. Then you might have business logic. So you know, if a value is this, then set this other value as something, uh, any of that actual logic in there. And finally, you might have some system logic. So how do I eventually send this to the database? So this might be EF Corp or some other ORM. This, of course, is what we call the spaghetti architecture. Uh, and it's definitely not as structured as that diagram, even though it's a bit of a mess. So that's sorry the model to, to start. Jump, sorry to jump back in on you, Luke. Um, I think you might not be sharing your slide deck. Uh, I can see Visual Studio. Um, that was in the, uh, that's in the, the screen share. I can do the screen share again. I've got the slide deck yep. up. Let me yeah. do that. Um, I might just yeah, do the uh, window if there's issues yeah. there. Let's jump yeah. down. Can you see no, the slide deck now? Uh, yes, we can. And this is how we can prove that we are presenting live, is that we are having technical difficulties along the way. All right, uh, back over to you now. <laughs> Cool. So I see the slides went up, so I'll just go over quickly. We had our diagram here with the little mess of presentation logic, business logic, and system logic. Uh, and that in a CS project might look like a few folders. So you might have controllers in a folder where your endpoints are. So that could be the presentation logic. You might have a data folder, which you might call your system logic. And services could be uh, your business logic. Now in a little spaghetti application, there could be business logic in the controllers folder and a big mess like that. So this is what we call probably the monolith. Now there's some pros to this one, right? There's little to no abstraction. It's very quick to build since there's no architecture. You just write some code and get it up and running. There's potential, keyword potential for performance. Abstraction comes at a cost, the CPU cycles and things like that. Uh, however, you know, if you need that performance, it is possible there. You can do things like AOT comp uh, compilation and things like that. There are some cons. So if you're building a larger app, a thing I like to call is inertia. So as your system and code base increases in size, the time and cost to develop new features increases basically at an exponential curve. Because of that and the tangled mess, it's difficult for multiple teams at once to work on that same code base. 
And any technology change you make basically breaks the whole system since everything is so tangled together like a plate of spaghetti. Now, similarly, it's very hard to test due to the spaghetti nature of it. What if we move this and separate some of the technical concerns out? So like the last diagram, what if we make it very explicit in that when we come into our web API here, we first do presentation logic, then it depends down onto the business logic layer, and it then depends down onto the data access layer, eventually hitting the database. In a .NET app, this might look like three projects. You could use folders, anything else like that. But you could have your presentation layer, which obviously would be your ASP.NET Core project. Uh, and you'll notice in here, our folders are similar. You might have controllers from the previous one. Instead of data, maybe repositories as a folder and models and services, potentially. This is what we might call the end tier, in this case, three tiers. There's pros to it. It's fairly intuitive. There's not tons of abstraction. You just need to know that there's a few little spots for things to go. It's fairly quick to build because, again, you're just still mainly writing code with not heaps of abstraction. And there's better testability. It's still not awesome. We'll talk about that in a second. But it's better than the monolith. Now, there's cons to it. This suffers from the same inertia problem as the spaghetti architecture, where as you get a larger code base and a larger product, the cost to develop increases at an exponential curve. Now, it's difficult for multiple teams at once. For that same reason, it still will become a tangled mess over time. Technology changes impact the whole system, so it's the same as the monolith. What if we then move to some clarity between the business use and technical concerns? So here, I've renamed a few of the terms from the previous diagram. We still have our presentation layer. And I've split out the data access and business logic into layers. So we've got application, which is primarily the business logic. And domain, for the sake of this diagram, let's say it's just our data uh, entities. So it could be previously in the data access layer, but we've made it explicit in that the domain's there. Now, the key point is the data access layer now, instead of everything being depending on it, it's at the top of this diagram and doesn't depend, uh, doesn't have the whole system depending on it, it's external to the system. Now this might look familiar, it's the clean architecture onion here, where the key thing is the core of the app in the gray layers there is the important valuable piece to the, uh, the business or the app domain uh, and presentation and infrastructure, the things tied to technology are external to the system and depend inwards, not the other way around. An interesting thing to note about clean architecture that is the main misconception I find uh, in that is looking at this entity's green circle right at the center of the original diagram from Uncle Bob. It's annotated saying that it has enterprise business rules. And then the application layer or use cases in this case has application business rules. Now, there's many ways to interpret this, but a nice way that I've found to settle on is that the domain layer or entities there you can put logic in there as long as it doesn't know or it's persistence or externally unaware. So in the application, we might have interfaces or ports for external systems like a database or another web API. That's great in the application layer, but if you can do logic that's unaware of something external, then I'd put that in the domain. So think of a game state. If there's a certain condition, then we need to you know, set it as game over, update some points, things like that, you can put in the domain. So that's a nice uh, little interesting point from the diagram. Now, you'll notice that they're fairly similar, but just different terms. So that's clean architecture in a quick nutshell. There's pros to it, right? There's lots of abstraction. We've ripped out the infrastructure from the bottom of the system to the external system, uh, and that adds a high amount of abstraction. Now, it's resilient to technology changes. This is the key benefit of that whole change. If you change your infrastructure, your whole system isn't aware of that, and it just should magically work. Now, there's the devil in the details, but that's the main point. Again, for the same reason, it's very testable because domain, again, there's nothing external in the domain, so you don't need to mock any testing for unit tests, as an example. And in the application layer, if you have abstractions there, you can mock the abstractions, and it will work. It's very explicit in that modularity. 
Now, it's not influenced by anything external because, again, infrastructure is on the external of the system. Now, this consistent velocity. So the other uh, architectures we talked about has kind of that inertia curve. For this, I think it's a little bit more linear where it just gradually increases over time. Because of the abstraction, it's a bit easier to work on by one or two teams, uh, but there's other scaling problems. You might want a modular monolith for more teams to have more explicit boundaries between what team owns what and what concerns you might uh, you know, step on each other's toes for. So there's cons to it though. There's a higher barrier to entry. So there's a lot of theory around it. We only brushed on the surface layer of clean architecture, but because of that, you need a lot of training to understand clean architecture. And a lot of projects make some pros and cons and have a trade-off and decisions like that and implement that in a code base. Now, adhering to that in a consistent manner requires a quite disciplined team to utilize it well and gain the benefits that you know we're paying down with the abstraction and dev time. Now, there is a slower development time overall, like I talked about. There is that higher barrier to entry to start but it is consistent. So if you've got a large complex product that's going to last a long time, clean architecture probably will be pretty good. Now, similar to that, there's lots of code to write a simple feature. The common complaint I hear is, hey, I'm building this you know, simple CRUD endpoint that reads a to-do item from the database, but I have to touch four projects or potentially eight projects if I'm writing tests, and that's crazy. Now, that might be a piece where you go and think, well, is my app really simple? And in that way, maybe I just use minimal endpoints and go end-tier architecture or just a spaghetti architecture. So you know, the symptom of the pain you're feeling might mean you've applied the wrong architecture. Uh, or if there is that complex system, then the lots of code to write the simple feature. In this case, it's complex, and it might be worth it. All right. With that context, let's jump into vertical slices. So, of course, to talk about vertical slices, let's talk about clean architecture right away. So what happens in a request or use case when you hit a clean architecture endpoint? So for this example, I'm looking at CRUD examples on to-do entities. Now, you'll notice they all kind of align in those horizontal lines. So there's some presentation logic so I always want to have an endpoint for each of these, then application for this. So there might be some service around it or validation, things like that. Domain, so these might all talk to the same to-do entity and eventually some sort of database operation. Now, when I draw lines across this, this is why clean architecture, you might hear it as layered architecture. The way it's written in code is from the technical concern. So these four layers. Now, again, this problem of having your code scattered against projects really gets shown when you have a large code base with tons of features. There's lots of scrolling because you know, you've got to scroll between 100 features, folders replicated in all of those layers. Now that can be quite painful. Before I jump forwards, I want to introduce a principle. So this is called the proximity principle. Now, any principle you don't need to apply everywhere, but this is what I find as the core of vertical slices. So code that is changed together should live together. Now, what does this mean? Well, instead of having these files sharded across many projects, if it's all related to the same use case or user story of, you know, as a user, I want to achieve X. So in the to-do case, let's say as a user, I want to mark a uh, to-do item as done. Everything that is code related to achieve that should be in the same folder and isolated. So how would we restructure this in a vertical slice manner? Well, same CRUD example. If we look at it with the, uh, the clean architecture layers, but instead put a folder on top. So create to do as a feature folder, read and so on and so forth. And putting the lines vertically this time, hence the name, right? We layered architecture or horizontally uh, sliced it. Now we're vertically slicing it. OK, but what does that look like? So in a web API, this might look like one ASP.NET Core host application. And in the same to-do example, you might have four folders, each with three bits in it. So we've got our same presentation logic at the top, some business logic, and some data access logic. 
So one way to implement your feature folder could be to have many end tiers in terms of the concept of what's going on uh, to eventually hit the database. Now, in a vertical slice, you can go and do anything in there, right? So it's a completely isolated folder. You could write a single line, uh, a single file, a big function that does way too much, or you could put a whole clean architecture uh, for project for one folder. You know, you can do anything. But there's got to be some middle ground again. Remember, we talked about pros and cons. There's a trade-off. So with VSA, we talked about some pros, right? There's little to no abstraction because you just put a folder and do something in there. It's up to you what you do in that folder. There's a low barrier to entry for that same reason. Any technology change you want to make, you can start to migrate each feature folder with no impact on the other features. So that's pretty cool. Now, the testability can be per feature again. What you do within the feature folder is a bit problematic because it's undefined. And we'll talk about that in a second. Now, it's easy to work on by many teams. There's two parts of vertical slices. There's shared code that all of the features touch. And then there's the slices that have no impact on other features. So if you're working within a feature, you don't have to worry about impacting another team or another product within the same code base, which is pretty awesome. And because of that, right, I can deploy and go to sleep and sleep well. Now, there's some cons as well, right? In any app, there's not completely isolated features. If I make a change to a to-do item, maybe it needs to send a notification or it needs to trigger a reporting update. So there's always gonna be features that communicate side by side. So we need to be very explicit in figuring out what messaging we need. So you know, a mediator pattern or a service pass, things like that you need to apply, and that has a complexity cost but it does have the benefit of being very explicit in side effects of code. It is also hard to choose what is shared code versus feature code. Now, shared code has that wider impact of being very high risk, and feature code obviously could fall into the point where you're replicating code. Now, there's pros and cons again, and that's something to think about. Each feature can be written in a different way when you're, uh, you know, say you've got two teams, different levels of knowledge, different opinions. If you're let loose, you might use one opinion and then someone else might use another opinion. And as a new developer onboarding, jumping between folders, you're basically looking at completely different code bases. And that's pretty problematic. We're, as developers, we're still human and cognitive load and things like that are still very important to consider in code. All right, that's interesting. So. We've talked about VSA, but there's still that black box of how do we do a actual slice in a maintainable manner that's traded off well. So not only is the demo kind of showing that it's quick to develop, it solves the other pain of potential inconsistencies and it not being clear how you do a folder. So let's jump into the demo now. For sake of time, I've run the terminal commands ahead of time and I'll jump over to the code in a sec. So to initialize a project, let's just make a new project directory, cd into it, and then using the .NET new templating engine, I've prepared this little template for a VSA application. Now this will create a ASP.NET Core .NET 8, of course, project, and we'll jump into that in a second. And if you run the start command, it'll open up in your uh, ID of choice. Now let me just change my screen share so that it goes to the IDE. Apologies, uh, I'd, I'd uh, lost my audio, so I didn't hear you call, but yeah, there <laughs> we go. We're back on. Awesome, awesome. Just in case, yeah, I moved it over. Awesome. So this is the project created with the .NET new template. Now there's a few things to look at in here. There's a test folder and a single source project. So immediately you might be thinking this is uh, you know, a monolith. But once you jump in, there's two distinct entry points within the project. There's the big high risk common code, which every feature uses, and the reduced risk calculated scope feature folders. Now, within this template, there's just a DB context using EF core and shared DB sets, and then a common IN point interface just to wire up uh, the feature folders to minimal endpoints in the host. Now, the interesting point is in here. So we can use uh, item templates. So the command I just showed created the whole solution, but using the same templating engine, you can create feature folders as a group, 
random individual files, collections of files. So as a consistent manner, you can create the same structure of feature among any project. So in this example, it comes with to do. And in here, we've calculated some risk. So there's shared code among this feature and its actions. So there's a shared to do entity. I don't want to be having four or more replicas of a domain entity for the example. Another way to reduce risk in this uh, template is our DB context is in common. So that's shared, and I don't like having shared code. So it's one layer of abstraction into the feature folder using a repository to wrap around it. Now, there's some endpoint code here just using minimal APIs, and it's not too important exactly what we do in this template, right? There's some decisions made, so we wire it up using the interface method and pass it to a handler. Now this just uses minimal APIs, and it's pretty cool to see it in a uh, non-lambda method in the program.cs. You can actually just use a normal method signature uh, and inject. So a request entity is bound correctly, injecting the repository and a cancellation token just wired up fine. Now, in this slice, we can do some logic. So this is orchestrating some domain or uh, you know, domain logic, then an interface, so we're doing application orchestration logic and then some presentation logic. Now again, it's not too important what I choose in this case. The cool thing with the .NET new templating engine is, say you've got an existing code base with decisions like this made. So if you pick clean architecture or vertical slices, maybe you've got an existing code base. If you make some decisions, you can create a .NET new template with that structure and enforce the consistency across the code base. So it's super important for vertical slices, but still cool for other structures. So this is one opinionated uh, choice of vertical slices, uh, where you just have an endpoint and request response objects. Now, to show it is using the uh, you know, latest .NET 8 with EF Core, Swagger, and some help methods. So let's just quickly demo. Now I moved it over from uh, the other desktop due to our tech issues, let me drag it over. You can hit a you know get, and in this case, it's nothing. If I post some text using that same wired up endpoint and create something, execute it, and then get again, we can see we've got a new entity here. That's pretty cool. So let me jump back to the slides. That concludes the demo of vertical slices and how the .NET new templates can solve the major problem of inconsistency among a slice in vertical slice architecture. So we've talked about a few architectures in this talk, but which uh, architecture should I use for my project? So there's a few things to consider, right? How many developers are on my team? How long will the project last? How complex is the problem I'm solving or the new uh, pro product I'm creating? Now, if there's not too many developers, maybe a monolith or an end tier app is fine. If I'm building it in one day and it will run in production for a long time without me touching it, maybe a monolith is fine or a spaghetti architecture because is the abstraction cost worth the dev time? Devs are very expensive, right? Is the business domain very complicated? Uh, whereas the actual systems isn't complicated. In that case, maybe it's a domain-driven design-centric uh, clean architecture approach. Do I want very distinct knowledge of side effects and easier barrier to entry in terms of what code I need to change? Maybe vertical slices are the choice there. So obviously, in the consultant fashion, the talk will end in a it depends, right? Developers are human, you need to Think about your team, the skill sets there, how long and how many developers are on the team. So in summary, we talked about spaghetti, spaghetti transforming into end tier, end tier moving that data access layer out to the top. That's really the key part of clean architecture to gain testability and resilience to change. Vertical slices kind of flipping the clean architecture on its side changing the code abstraction from technical concerns into business and use case concerns. And then finally, how you can get up and running with VSA quickly 
as well as solving the problem of potential inconsistency. So that's my talk. Thanks everyone very much. Thanks, Luke. That was really good. I, I really like the um, the way you kind of broke down the different architectures that we have and um, and how you can apply them to the different approaches. Um, I, I know we had a few technical issues, but like, like I said before, that's how we know that we're doing a live stream is that uh, you get to see the bugs and everything as they go out. Um, I, I did have one uh, one question for you. Is that the, the template that you showed us? Um, uh, is that a template that you've published that we could download and, and start using for projects ourselves, or was it more just some patterns you're laying out? Yep, uh, that template is on GitHub, so you can look at it on my GitHub on GitHub slash owner. Uh, it's up there. You can install it with the README uh, and you know make PRs and and you know, fork it and make your own decisions. So you can definitely just uh, look at the readme, give it a star if you found it interesting and useful. Uh, but yes, it's definitely there, public on GitHub. Like I said on the intro slide, I love open source, so I don't want to have that dissonance, right, where it's uh, closed source in my demo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and as someone who's a former consultant themselves, I loved how you just finishing like. <laughs> But the answer is it depends, and and anyone that's out there watching that's that's done consulting work will be just like, yep, that's that's exactly how it plays out, isn't it? It's it just it's going to be whatever's right for you. And I, I think the more that we talk about and look at the different ways that we can use things, the better informed we are to make the right decisions for what we're actually going to be doing. Hundred percent. It's just a you know another tool in the toolbox, right? To make the right decision, you need to be at least aware of the different things out there and you know, know where to look deeper and you know, what to pick in what case. Yep, exactly. Well, thanks for joining us um, at .NET Conf this year. Uh, it was a great session, and um, uh, we'll look forward to hopefully seeing you back next year. For sure. Thank you.